So just a quick intro to kind of recap what we're going to cover. Uh, obviously, um, uh, we still had some stuff to talk about for our, our subsetting. So we'll make sure that we finish up those last kind of few notes for subsetting. And then um, we will jump into chapter five, which I think we have two presenters for that tonight. So, yeah, uh, that's my bad. Seriously, I, I, you know, to be honest with you, this worked out perfectly because right after, like, we we established this, I got slammed today. So it's okay. actually best, but I am prepared. I guess maybe so better than usual. Good, because you could you could jump in whenever, like, for at least up now. You think there's something interesting? Just feel free to jump in, and we'll just kind of do it that way. Yeah. We always do that anyway, but at least you know you'll have more things to jump in with. Maybe that'd be good. There you go. <laughs> So I appreciate the group doing that um, and being flexible with that. Um, just a heads up, just a quick reminder about like the sign up sheet. You can access the sign up sheet in Slack. It's just on, it's just a Google sheet, and then I, I can show people the link if they need help with it. But like that's what I go off of. So it's like if if you fill in your name, like because I I don't even remember what I had for breakfast in the morning. So um, so I barely remember our conversations the week before. So um, yeah, that's kind of like the official one that I go with. But I will be sure to make sure that I double check to make sure I know who's presenting and stuff like that. So that was partly what I could do to make sure that I don't have any doubling up or make people do extra work and stuff like that. So, but I appreciate both Ryan and Ron for um, being flexible with this. So with that, well, I right think right after, Oh, go ahead. I was going to say right at, right after Ryan mentioned it in Slack, I'm like, wait a minute. I do vaguely remember him saying something at the end about that. <laughs> completely what? forgot about it. it was like a week later like three days later like oh no one signed up for that i better make sure that colin doesn't have to do it again so yeah. no worries yeah yeah I, I i i literally i probably couldn't even tell you what i did this morning so to remember what i did a week ago is like is really really pushing it so yeah. um but all right cool well i think we'll probably fin finish up our conversation with subsetting so i'll i'll transition over here um and then so we'll just finish that conversation and then we'll go for it Cool. Um, here, let me just share my screen. Oh, yeah, I, th I think we only had a few more to go with. Um, does everyone see my screen? Yep, cool. Yes. Um, I think I want to say we left off on, um, oh, I just had it, on ordering. So, right, th this is just the, the section where essentially, um, right, we learned about subsetting all the rules in R, and then essentially, like, this is just a quick little survey of how we can use those rules in R to apply them to, you know, typical data, um, typical analysis tasks, right, that we, like, encounter um, in day-to-day -day work. So one of them is um, ordering, which you can use with integer subsetting. So an example in the book was, um, say I wanted to sort this alphabetically, um, this vector, I can use uh, order X. So I can use the order function that will then return the indices that would then sort uh, that vector. And then you can just uh, subset that vector with um, with order. And then you get, you know, the sorted um, version. And I would say there's like a few ways you can do this, um, right? Like you can do this with data frames, right? You can like um, do like, uh, I guess maybe that doesn't work with that. <laughs> this one that worked. Uh, probably because you know why? I don't know why. What? Which one of this is not? It's dumb. DF2 not defined. Did I just not define DF? That might also just be uh, why. Maybe wait that, a minute. No, no. That's probably why. Yep, that's why. So I was like, I, I ran this before. <laughs> like this work. Uh, sorry about that, right? So you can uh, do the same stuff, right, with data frames. Um, if you wanted to, you know, randomly sample some of the row, rows, right, with, um, you could do uh, like that, right, where you just get the rows and then say, I want um, the columns from like three to one, just reverse that order, right? Um, you can do it right with the order function. You can also order the names of uh, columns in a data frame. Uh, then you know you have the tidyverse analogs, which I think are just a bit more easier to read, right? You can just arrange uh, a data frame by a column. In this case, they'll default by um, which I call default in ascending order. And you can also, uh, what's cool is you can also do it with. Um, um, you can also use like the order function within select, and you can just like order uh, the names like alphabetically. Um, I believe with this, with the base R pipe, you might have to specify the data frame again, but I know with um, 
them greedy or pipe, right? You can just use the uh, dot notation, right? Which just references um, DF2. Um, this one was actually interesting because, um, so they gave an example in the book of expanding aggregated accounts. So imagine you had like some data set, right? That had, you know, aggregated accounts for maybe some sort of field. And I was trying to think like, would anyone ever do this? And then I actually remembered that I actually did this um, a few weeks ago, essentially like at my work, we wanted to uh, analyze our historical performance for like our cloud customers. For some of them, we uh, send them um, a bill quarterly, but since we want to show this on a monthly basis, right? We essentially want to like simulate, okay, essentially like take that like quarterly billing and then just chop it up into uh, three months. So that's actually an example where I was like thinking, like, oh, this is actually like something I've done in, in my work. Um, so it's like pretty easy um, in terms of like, I think like conceptually, right? Like imagine you had this um, aggregated data frame and maybe you just wanted all, uh, you wanted to essentially like disaggregate it. Um, so you get like the actual individual um, you know, it's funny, like... we, we were just talking about this because this came up in one of the AOC things. And I mm -hmm. learned about there's a tidy thing called uncount, which is does this in a much cleaner, nicer way. Oh, like... okay, neat. <laughs> That's actually great. Of course, there's a tidy first, right? <laughs> I, just learned about it. That. I just learned about it. Oh, awesome. Um, but yeah, right. So it's like you're essentially just um, at least right right with like this code is that you're just taking all of the rows right of this like aggregated data frame and then you're just multiplying it by um and 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 in this case like the number of rows that are like associated with that group um and that and then you can essentially get like a disaggregated uh, data frame so if you want to do stuff like i remember what i do in my analysis like plot stuff on like a monthly basis or whatever piece of data you're working with this is like an easy way you can do it in base r or you can use uncount <laughs> which probably saves you some typing um but I thought, you know, that that was like something I, when I was initially going through the book, I'm like, I would never do this. And I'm like, oh, wait, if you did. <laughs> um, and it, it works with tibbles too. Um, but again, use on count. <laughs> um, moving columns, right, from data frames. I think this looks like pretty easy. Uh, you can do it uh, like how you would with lists, right? You can like uh, use a dollar notation and then set that um, column name to null. So you can do it like that, or uh, maybe you just want to, grab a certain, uh, you know, cer certain subset of columns. So you can just do that with uh, character subsetting. Uh, you can use, if you, let's say you didn't know what type, you, you, you knew that you wanted every column, but one column you can use uh, set dip, which will just take the, uh, the names in that data frame and then uh, just remove the column Z in this case. Uh, I think like a lot of things, sometimes it's just easier to do it the tidy way, um, especially for like some of these more like pretty standard tasks. So if, if an example like, hey, I just want to get all the columns, but see, you can just do select, you know, minus C. And maybe if I just wanted like these certain set of, of columns, right, you can do select X, Y. And obviously, like, I think we're all familiar with the tidyverse, you know, you can do like more um, complicated things saying like, maybe I want all of the column names that like contain this value, right? Or um, maybe you just, you know, stuff like that, right? Um, that you can do. Um, then selecting rows based on the condition, right? So um, this bit, I think we've learned that will return, this will return a uh, what logical uh, vector where all of the, of trues and falses, trues obviously indicating when a gear is equal to five, false otherwise, and you can just take that Boolean vector and then subset your data frame. Um, in this case, right, we're just saying, hey, I want all of the uh, rows and empty cars where gear is equal to five, and I want all of the columns, right, um, which is, you know, given by the fact that I'm not like selecting anything um, as an indexing. Uh, you can then obviously chain this with multiple conditions. So the next condition we're saying is that we want all rows and empty cars um, that have gear equal to five um, and have like four cylinders. Tidyverse, also again, pretty easy, where you can just take your data frame, pipe it to filter, um, and then, you know, add in any condition right that you want. Um, I think, is this, yeah, so this is the last section. Um, it was talking about the correspondence between Boolean algebra and sets, which I thought was pretty interesting. So over here, we're just gonna create a Boolean vector um, where, um, you know, like sample, I think it's right, right? Sample, uh, sample's weird. Yeah, it's like it samples, right? Um, one through 10, right? And it just, 
yeah, one, two, three. Yeah. So it just creates a vector, right, with like 10 values, one through 10. Um, and it's just saying, hey, what, you know, where are the, which ones are less than four? And then which just returns the indices where that's true. Um, if you wanted to kind of reverse that operation, R doesn't have an unwitch, you know, a way to do that. So you can just make a quick function that does that. Um, it's like pretty simple. Um, it was the which I think it was, yeah. Um, sorry. Okay, cool. Um, so this is kind of right showing the correspondence. We're just, you know, doing this stuff here. But um, if we do X1 and Y1, right, that will just ask, okay, where are, return, show me the indices where both of, uh, both of them are true. Um, so if we do that right here, right, X1 and Y1, That'll just then give you a vector where it'll show, you know, false, 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 false. And it's saying that the last indice um, between them is true. Uh, and then if I do the intersection, the intersection is the values right there shared between two vectors that will then return. Um, in this case, it will return me at indice 10 uh, or index 10. This is where um, this condition, right, uh, it, where they're both true. Uh, set union, it just returns whether or not. Um, either x1 or y1 are true. So you can either, um, right, you can like figure that out by just doing x1 bar, right? So x1 or y1. Um, so it will be only false if they're both false and it'll be true if at least one of them are true. Um, and then union, right, just set theory, it just gives you, um, returns the indices in this case where they are both like true, with either true or false. Um, set difference. You can just think of um, as essentially it's like my mind is like is essentially dropping the indices that are shared by x1 and y1. Um, so you know you can just say what are the indices in um, x2 right that are not in um, y2. So almost it's almost like a um, you know like an anti join right where I, I just want to find like these values that are in the left, like, let's say the left-hand side of the equation that aren't in the right-hand side. And the last one is exclusive or XOR, um, which I usually just visualize it as essentially, I want all of the values that are in left-hand side and all the values in the right-hand side, but I do not want values that are shared, right, by both of them. And you can either, you know, do that with, um, you know, XOR, or you can essentially just compute like the set difference between the union of the end of these indices, um, and then minus, right, the set difference of like the intersection of that. So, right, you're just removing the indices where they're both shared. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was it. Um, that was like a pretty good chapter. I think it clarified some stuff for me, sometimes like the weird behaviors of subsetting with base R. Um, but yeah. It's crazy to see like how succinct like the tidyverse stuff is in comparison to some of like the base R stuff, like, and like just the readability of it too, you know, like you're like just seeing select and like how minimal that is compared to like the base R is like the readability is just amazing. So I like the interface, but um, the set algebra stuff that I still have to go over, but I feel like you could write some really succinct code if you like could like use those unions and sets and, and everything else. So I need to dig into that a little bit more. Yeah. Sets, they're the core of mathematics. <laughs> All right, cool. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments? I'm good. Cool. All right, cool. Well, I think we can make the transition over to chapter number five. And so I'll turn it over. All right, I will figure out where my screen is. I think it's this one. Sharing is caring. Okay, there we go. Let me move this little window over so I can. Oh, there we go. All right, should you see? Uh, you should see the notes now. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. So this is chapter is about control flow, and I'm sure you guys have all done control flow. So it's sort of like a more. Um, 
you know, we're, you know, we'll go over the basics of the, the tools for controlling flow of execution, but the idea is to look at some of the technical pitfalls and perhaps some lesser known features that come up with these. Uh, so there is two main groups of control flow, right? Choices, which way, you know, which of these pieces of code we can execute, and loops, uh, repeatedly running code over and over again. And, you know, it's funny, it's funny to me because it's like, oh, let's learn about for loops. It's like, no, what, I'm, what I really want to learn about in R is how not to use for loops because that's like what I'm almost always crabbing for. But, <laughs> but sometimes you just need a for loop. No, no way around it. Um, I found, at least in the advent of code, there's a lot of opportunities where I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but this is going to be a for loop. <laughs> I tried my best to do this with maps and reduces and everything else. So in any event, and then I find out later that one of the other people did it with a map and a reduce, no problem. So, hey, live and learn. So first uh, up is choices. Uh, the, the main thing here, of course, is the if statement. Uh, including the else, right? So you guys all written these kind of things before. I'll just give you a quick example here. You know, if the test expression is true, then you get the true action. If it's false, you get the false action. Um, and you can chain these together, you know, if, else, if, else, like this, and you can keep chaining them along. We'll see later there's other ways to, to better express that. If you end up with really long chains of if, else, if, so you're probably doing something wrong and might want to think about doing your code a different way. But uh, this is, Fairly basic, right? Stuff. But just a quick little exercise here. Uh, this is from the book, just to make sure we understand things. Uh, why does this work? Anyone have any input on that? So we take a list, uh, a vector of one to ten, and we we ask if the uh, you know ask the length of it, and we put that in as a condition, and we get not empty. Why does that work? So I I thought this one was interesting too. And from the way I the way I picked it apart and the way I understand it is, is that, well, if you're wrapping length around this vector of one to 10, length is going to return one value, which is going to be 10 because mm -hmm. one through 10 is length 10. So that's a number. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's a number, there are certain coercion rules that if follows that will convert it into a logical. And I think those rules are is if like something's there, it returns it as true, right? Something like that was what I was thinking. Oh, I, I was thinking about it. Um, I know within Python, it's like, for instance, if it's like an empty list, I know in like Python, and if I do like if, you know, let's just say this empty list is like yeah. X, right? Then it would be, oh, wait, am I? Uh, let me run. Yeah, the second one does, uh, yeah. X is just an empty list. And then, yeah. Yep. It works. It works too that way. It's empty. Yeah. So you get false now. I do expect. Yep. But does like R do like the same ray again, right? Where like kind of like it seems Python. To, I mean, I did some experimenting. It seems like it has the same kind of truthiness. You know, they call it truthy. You know, so zeros, empty lists, and things like that are faulty, and and non-zeros and and, mm. and non-empty things are truthy. <laughs> and sometimes the language is used. I've seen in computer yeah. science folks, but yeah, because so the zeros, values nulls. Because ten is a non-zero value, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. So if you put if zero, you'll get false as well, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Which is what length of the X is. So that makes sense. Okay. Because that's what if you that's... put in just an, if you just put it if X, where F is X is numeric, um, just empty list too. I think that should, does that work too? No wonder. Yeah, no, it or does. I've, I've, I've done logical. it before. I've done it before too, where it's, it'll, um, it'll do it. So it's like kind of similar, right, with like Python, where like if no, I like doesn't one... like that. Oh, it doesn't. Oh. So it doesn't. No. So so unlike in Python, an empty list is not false. An empty list is just argument of length zero. Oh. So uh, and it fails, which brings us to the next section. So yeah, so it looks like zeros are are the so zero can be coerced to a logical. Hmm. Uh, an empty list doesn't get coerced to a logical, unlike in Python. Like you said, in Python you could just put like oh. I could just put if X and not empty, it would work yeah. this time and not in. Uh, that's an interesting, I, I, I just assumed that actually, I just tried it. So, but yeah, Wait, no, Colin, that goes right to the next chat. Can you go back real quick, Colin, before we shut that down? So you, I, I don't know if I heard you right, but so you're saying um, for the first, the top example, the reason why, well, no, sorry, the bottom example, the reason why it's empty is we've created a numeric vector, but it has no length because all we've done is say, yeah, create an empty numeric vector if length, right? zero yeah so if zero zero 
uh, trans converts into false. Yeah, there's, um, if you go look at, like, if you look at the, the documentation for, um, if you go look at the documentation for if, mm -hmm. I think it's the condition argument, we'll talk about it, where it's like any length one logical vector that is not NA, uh, other types are coerced to logical if possible, ignoring any class. So, you know, this is a length zero, so numeric mm -hmm. is a length zero. So therefore the if statement returns it as false. Oh. And then because it's false, it returns it the empty character string or empty. Right. So. Yeah, sorry. I, I just um yeah, I want to make sure I grab that. No, that's I think that's a yeah. good, good clarification. I, I, <laughs> Go ahead. I was confusing things a little bit with my my Python. It was confusing me a little bit there for a minute. Like some so, of it, it's like back some to of it, this end. Like, Oh, just one thing, just like some of it's like it, like I think Hadley really wants to like dig into like the function, like mm -hmm. documentation. So like some of this, I think yes. gets cleared up by reading into like the documentation of like the if statement and like the if else. So, but sorry about that, Ron, I didn't mean to cut you off. No worries. Yeah, it definitely helps to read the documentation, which I did look at earlier, but promptly forgot. So some of the things about the if is that it only this is what we we're just talking about the condition must evaluate to a single true or false otherwise it's going to be usually typically an error so you can't be a vector in there can't be an empty list like we just found out it has to somehow either convert to or evaluate directly to a single true or false uh, the exception they says a logical vector of length greater than one will only generate a warning and but only will actually use the first element of that vector um, so he, he recommends setting this condition R check length one condition to true, but it must be the default because I did it with my R, it, it gives an error. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't like uh, vectors for even Boolean vectors, which is good. That's what you want because if, if you did if it did take the Boolean vector, it does the wrong thing. It doesn't do what you expect. It doesn't do a vectorized F at all, right? <laughs> Just gives you a, so I'm glad it does the uh, die instead of warn. At least now. I don't know if it's the default or not, but on mine it does. You can try it on yours. You can see what if C true false does on yours. But I think it's it a, I think it's a default as of like 4.2. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. as from R 4.2, conditions of length greater oh, than one are an error. So ah, okay. I'm trying to find that. I couldn't find it. Appreciate you looking that up. So speaking of that, if you do have a vector and you want to do a vectorize if there's the if else function. And it kind of works just like you might expect. It's a function. The first uh, it takes vectorized test, vectorized true, and uh, vectorized false, I guess, uh, results, right? So this is a good example. Here's an example right here. Say, well, if I take the numbers from 1 to 10, I do a vectorized if else and take all the ones that are modulo 5, 0, I get an xxx. For the other ones, I just get it back again as a character. This as character is just because we want all the, the both results to be the same, right? And that brings us to what the book says hey, only use if else when the yes and the no vector are the same type as otherwise it's hard to predict the output type. And he doesn't talk about if else, but there's a deplier if underscore else now um, in tidyverse that enforces that recommendation essentially, which is what you want. Here's an example right here. Here's if else, um, true, true, false. And I've if it's true, I give it A. If it's false, I'm going to give it three. I just end up with characters, it turns out. Um, in that case, but if I try with if underscore else from deplier, it gives a, it gives an error. It says, "Oh no, you want these to be the same type before." What are you doing? You're probably making a mistake. <laughs> type of thing, right? And again, I love these things when things fail like this. Is sometimes lex. As I think he makes this point later on in this chapter, but less flexibility is usually better. <laughs> less likely to shoot yourself in the foot if you have less flexibility. Let's see. I mentioned that you know the multiple if else chains so the way to more often a less flexible way to to do that is with a switch um, which can be very handy that looks like i just to give this example this is an example from the previous uh cohort which i left in here because i thought it looked pretty cool um, he uses switch here as the example switching on the type which is a character and then if the character matches mean no there's no quotes on these in the switch it's, uh, it's just left as it is, unevaluated. So if it matches the string, basically matches mean, matches median, or matches trim, they'll return that particular function here, right? It's a function, or actually evaluate that function at the point at the, for the data x. 
And so he created some uh, data frame of um, some random, uh, I actually changed it to be log norm rather than Cauchy in the previous example, but I, I used 100 log norm values. And then let's see where are the means, the medians, and the trimmed. And I just use that function. This is probably the most complicated way to do this, but I use that mapping function we made um, right here, right? Yeah, here it is. So I, I supplied that to um, uh, the center function to the different the different centers, mean, median, and trimmed, right? So that's just an example of using switch. It's just seemingly now as I'm talking about, it seems more convoluted than necessary. <laughs> Uh, but switch is somewhat limited and restricted. And again, I, I'll say that's actually a good thing, right? It means you have to do things a certain way and make sure they work. So before you know, we go on, over. before we go on, I'm yeah. a little, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure out how switch is being used here is what Me I'm too. Yeah, I, I um... So I have this data frame, which could have just been a list, mean, median, and trimmed, right? So I'm going to I apply this function up here that I made to that. So to the to the data values x and then to that string right so the first one is going to be center these random variables and t is going to be mean so when i call center with t and mean it's going to pick it's going to switch on that right here's the switch part so type is going to be mean in that case so it matches mean equals or it is mean so it returns it does this function the notation is kind of weird with switch right it's like mean equals mean you know it's like it's like but anything can be on this other side is equal what this means is when it matches this one do you know, return this other thing on the right hand side of the equals? I think like a right hand arrow would have been a little bit better there, but um, this is the notation we were, we got. Yeah, because what's confusing me on this is like it's not it's not necessarily well. I mean, it's related to the plot, but I think what's confusing me about this is is like the, how it's applied. I get it how it's applied in the s apply, right? Like you're mm -hmm. passing in these character values of mean, median, trimmed, and yeah. it's going to create it's going to create a, a, a you know it's going to create. I'm guessing three, no, three different data sets, right? And then it's right. taking those three different data sets. Three different putting, values. Yeah. Three so different values. Yeah, three there's different only values. One data set the three different values for the three different measures of the um, center tendency. Okay. I see what it's doing now. Line. Yeah. I I'm, see what it's doing now. I it admittedly is overly complicated example. So you couldn't hey, just do the same thing with like kind of cool. case when I that's my question. You could, you could also oh, if, imagine see, if you like chained that, like yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or like if you wanted to like Here's chain case a lot one, of, like, much better. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big like some some of this so, is like I'm a big like case when dude. I don't know about the rest of you, but like I, I a lot of times I have to create like yeah, sort yeah, of, like, sure. horrible subgroups and stuff, and so I um yeah, yeah so I'll, I'll, I definitely want to try the switch thing, but. It's kind of some of this stuff is. I wouldn't. If, <laughs> oh, really? I'm not recommending it. I, if you can use case when, use case when for sure. Yeah, no, no, no I'm not. Is I, mean, I guess which I, is I, similar I should, to if. I should say I I, I, I want to look more into you know what it is. I mean, I'm oh, like, okay, gotta sure. get it. To, still, when you need it. Yeah. Anyway, I think it's like I think like yeah. switch seems to be more useful if let's say like you have some sort of function and you want to like maybe dispatch certain behavior given yeah, like the argument you enter in yeah. right, but like. I, I imagine I don't want to like cut you off, right? That's but true. like, um, let's say, Merritt, you're doing like what you were saying, Ryan, like uh, you need to like recode some groups. You'll probably just use like case one, right? Cause you want to keep it in a table um, or yeah. wherever, right? Data structure you have. And like case one's just a more elegant way to do that than like switch. Switch, switch for yeah. me, switch is great in the context of a shiny application. Mm. Like that's, oh, yeah, sure, that's, Ryan, that's where I think switch you. really shines. But if it's like data manipulation, it's, case went all day like yeah <laughs> that's just my viewpoint so uh so bringing that that brings us to case when case when is like a more general version of if else for they can be used in kind of more general in some sense but it can be used in, in place of multiple chained if else is right not chained almost like sub functions right or s applying switch is what i just did right just s applied switch which you know if you're doing an s applying something you probably sometimes i think there's like, there gotta be a better way if i'm s applying something or mapping something and here uh, is that better way so this is the same problem again i've got the centers i got this stupid data frame just three character three character strings in it uh for type and then i'm just using case one now to, to select which function i want to apply and this is what it looks like basically um you just have your you have your condition and then you just use a little squiggly thing to say uh, what you want the result to be it's pretty straightforward 
got a, you know it has a unique notation but it, once you got it down it's it's pretty easy to use right and that brings us to loops anything else uh, Ryan, do you have anything else to say about conditions while before we move on to the yeah. loop um yeah i guess say anything you uh, you know, I, to, to Colin's point, like I, one of the things I did start to do was like I went in, like I ran the, the for the the documentation for the if function, and um, one thing that I thought was kind of weird. Um, well, hold on, let me just put it in the chat as a way of sharing real quick, like, but. Um, So like, th this was um, something from the book. I don't know if you all can see this. But it says, what type of vector does each of the following calls if L? So the, 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 this was in, um, I forget if this was in the documentation or in the book, but it says, if else returns a value with the same shape as test, which is filled with elements selected from yes or no, depending on whether the element of test is true or false without that the, the whole idea of shape i guess it's just like length and like what the attributes are or I, is that all that we're can y'all see what I, I posted i'm not i yeah i do see what you posted i don't know i'm not sure exactly what why it says what it means by shape either other than just dimensions yeah i guess maybe that maybe i'm overthinking this maybe shape just really means um you know, length and, and like what the you know attributes of the type are or whatever, but um I thought that was kind there of there was an exercise though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exercise for that. It's it's interesting to I, I mean like because some of the language is like some of the language for like and again I'm not trying to bash on base R or anything, but like <laughs> some of the some of like the language around some of the base R like stuff you're just like I, how does that you know, how's that playing? Like the yes, no, I know this doesn't answer your question directly, but like, mm -hmm. you know, like the two arguments and if are yes, no, it's like, uh, I don't know if that's the best language to, you know, use around. So I think shape, I think is referring to what you're thinking of it is, is like the length of it. So if you're passing in a vector, it's the shape of it is the length, but yeah, I mean, I might be reaching to. I, I think I think I I, yeah. I I think you're right. I mean, I guess I just w wanted to raise it as something. Here's another one that I really like from Hadley. I, I recommend assigning the results of an if statement only when the entire expression fits oh, yeah. on one line. Otherwise, it tends to be hard to read. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I guess I kind of agree with that. I don't know. Um, some of it just has to do with like how you space, I guess. And then, um, oh, and then. Hold on. So I don't know if did we talk about this, but like the other one of the other things I kind of thought about. Um, <laughs> sorry, I almost just dropped something into uh, um, into into um, Slack. Sorry, that's not the right place to drop stuff. Okay, yeah. So when you use single argument forms without else, if it turns null, so I thought that was kind of interesting, right? Like this was something that. Um, Maybe you already raised this yeah. rock, to me. Like I, I don't know. Like, no, I did. No. Sometimes I think the, the 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 best lessons from these types of chapters is these little things, like you know, like something like this, like you know, if you uh, remember true. that, you know, if returns in an indivisible null. I mean, I, I can see why that would be functionally interesting. I don't know. I don't have any real answers. Sorry, but I, I um some of these little kind of like. Easter. I mean, I generally try to avoid using if as an expression. Like, I mean, I don't know if it is an expression because everything is an R, but I just try to avoid using return mm -hmm. values from the regular if at yeah. all, all times. Well, that I was mean, it for that reason. Because you can use, you can always use if else, you know. I I, I part I partly want to I partly want to think that kind of goes hand in hand with what Hadley's saying, like keeping it as like one liners. Because mm -hmm. first off, it's like. Yeah. My first question would be, have you ever tried to debug uh, uh, like a triply nested uh, if statement? <laughs> yes. That's not yeah. fun. No. And then the other thing is, is if you, if, you know, it's good behavior to have the null, like there's some benefits to it too. But like, if you have those complicated if else statements and it's returning null, but you don't know where that null is returning at, yeah, it it's, from, yeah. it's even harder to debug it. So it might be valid code. It's returning null, 
but finding where that's happening could be challenging sometimes. So I think this kind of goes hand in hand with what Hadley said of like, if you're going to use if statements, they need to be one liners or at least yeah. try and keep them as concise as possible. Yeah, I can see that. But that's again, I don't, I can't read Hadley's mind, but that's what I thought when I read that. I think you're closer than me. That's for sure. Okay. So back to this, um, Loops, we're all familiar with loops, so this just mm -hmm. quickly reviews, you know, four items in vector. I guess one thing to call out is that unlike in Python, uh, fours are always iterating over some kind of a vector. Um, so it's this is always the syntax for item and vector, or I shouldn't say not like Python, but unlike in many languages, right? If for loops normally it can iterate over, I mean, you can it's completely general. You can put anything here, you can go one to 10, you can still do any kind of for loop, but it's always a vector of some kind even if it's one you just created just for that purposes of, of, of iterating over. Um, and there's a quick example. That's all I don't need to belabor that. Uh, and I don't know if you've used this before, but if you need to exit out of a, if you need to skip the rest of a current iteration, you can use the next statement. Um, it'll just mm -hmm. complete the, uh, it'll just jump to the end of the loop and then break will exit the loop completely if you've never used that. Um, those are useful things. Here's a couple examples. No need to belabor that, I don't think. Um, so, a quick exercise, another this is from the book too. I just picked this one out to look at real quickly. Um, here's a, a vector C123, and I say, okay, um, for X in X's, the same X up here, I'm gonna do this loop where I assign to X's now uh, the combining of X's and X times two, right? So the X for that loop. So and you can see this is the result. If you do that, you get one, two, three, two, four, six. So what does that tell us? He's asking us about the vector being iterated over here. Anyone? That you're just looping over the elements. I could also just totally be missing something. <laughs> I don't know. Well, the thing you're supposed to take account is like, hey, wait a minute, I'm changing X's, right? So I've just changed it here in each iteration of this loop. Oh. It doesn't seem to affect, you know, you, why doesn't this become an infinite loop? Because I keep making X's longer and I, I'm never going to get to the end of it, right? Uh, well, what this tells us is, in fact, X's is just immediately evaluated just once at the beginning of the loop, and then it's, that's it. It's not uh, oh. evaluated every time you go through. Um, Unlike X, which is evaluated each time. But hmm. So this doesn't create an infinite loop. It does work kind of how you might hope. So that was, that was one of the exercises in there, which I thought was kind of interesting. Moving on to pitfalls. Um, these are, I thought this is kind of goes with Ryan saying, this is probably uh, one of the, the little nuggets in this chapter of these pitfalls for the for loops. One of them is pre-allocate uh, pre your output containers before you loop over them, because otherwise your code will be much, much slower. What, because what happens every time a loop, as you grow that container, it'll re look for more memory. So if something's going on behind the scenes, it's mathematically the same, but it'll be much slower. So it's better to first create your your structure and then iterate over it if you're gonna if you're gonna create something if you're gonna fill in a container that's initially empty better to start with a big empty container and then assign to it in the loop rather than just continually growing it in a loop uh and you'll see that i see that a lot in example code where people do that so like in the islr book uh, introduction to statistical learning book he does he does a lot of base r in that book and he does a lot of pre allocations though um, the other one is be aware that one, uh, the iterating from the vector one to length of V can do surprising thing when V has length zero, because you'll actually iterate backwards from one and to zero. Of course, that doesn't do anything, but um, you might have expected to get no iterations, but you actually get one iteration plus this iteration over zero. So he recommends using sequence along, which I started using after I read that. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll start doing that. <laughs> it's one of the first things I learned in like, I don't know if y'all have taken like, <laughs> oh, is it? Roger Pang's like, course like you know like the r for data science which is like on coursera oh. that was like you know a real game changer for a lot of people and i do remember like learning about loops and it's funny yeah i, I hardly ever use them anymore yeah. but i do remember that seek along thing it's funny and he he also mentions this is kind of something that might be more important later but if you are iterating well no actually it could be important all the time because we use s3 vectors all the time even if we're not building them um use he recommends instead of just iterating over them in the x and axis type method right to avoid stripping off its attributes well here just to look at the example 
he defines this array of two dates, right? And then when he iterates over them in the most straightforward way, it's that, oh, I know I'm going to be clever. I'll do X and X's and just print it out. I get, oh, what happened? The attributes disappeared. This is some kind of, this is a, our, our, uh, our issue here. But um, uh, so we just get this, you know, the, the representation of the, the date time. So he recommends just doing the uh, element lookup yourself, use SQL along, uh, and then it works just fine if you do it that way. If you use the uh, subsetting that we just learned about in the loop. So those are the, 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 the three pitfalls he mentioned. I thought that was, those are all pretty informative and learned something from that for myself for sure. Hope that made sense because in the beginning I kind of like put 14 sentences together in three different ways. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, clear as mud. Okay. Yeah. Let's see what else. I think that was almost it. I just, oh, before, um, he also says there's some related tools. For example, uh, you can use a while loop if you want to, you know, while condition, do the action. Sometimes you want to do that. Um, performs the action as long as the condition is true. Use that whenever you don't know how long the loop's going to be. Um, even more general is the repeat action, which is, you know, just does the action forever. never stops until you break out of it, that is, right? It's basically the same as a while true, though, right? So... And he makes this point like, well, four can be written as a while and while can certainly be written as a repeat, you know? Um, so this basically goes only in one direction, except, except I just said you can do a repeat as a while true, but um, however, he makes this really good point. This, actually, this is really the true good nugget out of this chapter, in my view. The last thing he says here is it's good practice to use the least flexible solution to your problems whenever possible. So use four whenever possible. And then he says, well, wait a minute, don't even do that. Don't use four. Um, use map and apply, which we're going to learn about later. These are even less flexible. And I, uh -huh. I like this concept of trying to use the least flexible option because you're less likely to shoot yourself in the foot when you try to roll your own uh, solution, right? Yeah, totally. You know, mistake, mistakenly put the wrong condition in there or whatever, you, you know, in, in your loops or whatever, right? So that was, uh, that was a cool idea. So that's it for me. Did you have anything else to add, Ryan, about um, loops? Or at all? About this no, thing? I guess you know the only thing I, uh, I spent more time on the, the 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 choice stuff. I would say like I don't know. Oh, if, it, hold on. Oh, I'm I'm not on mute. Sorry. Um, do you guys ever use like while loops? I mean, like I can't even think of a of an example where that even come. I mean, comes up. I, I've only used it in a class, and that was because. Exactly. It literally yeah. a class. <laughs> it's like here's a while loop. I used it in I used it in last night's advent of code. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I need to do that. I, you know, every year I go, I'm going to do the advent of for, of code thing, and I and I and I never. I mean, I read other people's solutions, but man, I never. It's yeah, it's too too much. Um, it's a big time suck. It is. Yeah, it looks like well, the creativity is crazy on some of that stuff. But I bet a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with is probably well served because you have all these crazy, like you know, problems you need to solve or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I uh, I um, I'm, I'm up for doing functions if you if unless someone else signed up for it already. I feel bad. I, I made it such a mess out of this. No, you're good. You're good. Um, um, I, I took on functions, but if you if you want it a year, I'm more than happy for you to take it. Um, well, how about this? You do functions, and then uh, let me see. Let me see. Um, do you want to do environments? Because I could switch over to do conditionals. Yeah. The next one over. That's fine. I'll do. I'll do environments. Yeah. All right. I'll switch over to conditions then. Okay, so got it. All right. Yeah. I mean, whatever works. I mean, if you yeah, if you I could do functions. I have it right now, but. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll I'll do functions. I, I mean, that's something that I I really want to learn more about. Um, even though I've written, I'm sure many of us have written a lot of functions before. <laughs> I've written a lot I've, of bad functions. <laughs> I've written Brian, functions that I put, think are good. Oh, go ahead, Brian. Do you want me to put your name in there? Yeah, for yeah. Hold on, just for, while we're doing this. Sorry to be such a because you know, I um okay. So if I go to Oops, like the, 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 the page. Do I go to the GitHub repository to sign up? No, you just, uh, I can send you the link right now here. Yeah, send me the link, sorry. Yeah, because I, um, I, 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 yeah, I flaked, but I should have. Um, 
on the um also too it's in like if you go to up top like and you go if you go to the yeah. channel and it does oh. are, it's book so volunteer to present yeah it's bookmarked at the top and then you just go to cohort seven but there's the link for it too right there did you get it yeah hold on i i this is just three pinned and then okay well it says um I can share my screen too. Just go ahead and yeah. Sorry, man. I, I no, I you're good. You're good. You're good. Um, because it took me a while to figure out the bookmarks too. I mean, I, I, I've I've definitely signed up. I just I don't know. Like I was trying to find it the other day, and I was like, I thought I I wasn't sure if I had or hadn't. Um, yeah. So if, here's what the Slack looks like. So I'm in the channel for Book Club R Advanced mm -hmm. R. If you go up here on your, oh, it yeah. should be volunteer. Click drop down. Click cohort seven, and then it'll oh, right. pop it up in your browser. Ugh, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Okay. It took me a while to know one know that there are um, that there are bookmarks, but John likes to organize the community by putting bookmarks, and so which is funny. okay. I so know. I would be doing okay. So you, you, oh, I see, Ron. You put it in as uh, yeah. Down for, okay, I got it. So wait a minute. So what is the? Oh, I see. So the, the counts on the right are just are, okay. Yeah, I see now. Perfect. Yeah, I will. I will do uh, environments. That is actually something I really need to learn more about. Yeah, and then we'll do we'll do functions next week, and then we'll skip for the holiday, um, mm -hmm. and then Boxing we'll day. yep Boxing Day, and then we will get to <laughs> uh, yeah, then we'll do environments and go on from there. Um, but yeah, there's definitely you know if there's more of these that you know that you want to do, um, definitely sign up. Uh, I don't know why this black column's in here, but. There must be some reason for it. <laughs> he might just be trying to keep these two separate. So, um, so yeah, I mean, unless there's any other questions that people have, mm -hmm. any other comments, I guess my one comment was with while I've never used a while loop either. I mean, I know mm -hmm. about them, but I've never used them. So yeah, uh, I did have a question about one of these, but I can't remember what it was anymore. So I'm not going to waste people's time trying to figure out the question that I had, but there was some question that I had with like, uh, if I find it, I'll put it in the Slack. It's not, it's not worth, mm -hmm. I'm not going to waste your guys' time by me digging to find the problem that I had. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, 10 minutes. I mean, it's either this or go back to work. So I don't know yet. Right. Um, <laughs> oh shoot. I yeah. forgot these were recorded. Whoops. No. Yeah. <laughs> John, edit uh, that part out. No, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, I don't know if I, so. Ron, you said you were doing Advent of Code, right? Yeah, it might be my last day yesterday, though. They, they keep getting harder, and I keep it taking up too much. It's taking up too much time. I got to day four, and like I said, I quit because I was just. He said, just sucks so much time. And then I tried to time box myself, like to say, like, okay. You're only gonna spend an hour looking at it, and then it just still just sucks so much time. So I was like, "Yeah, uh, it's like the people that get I'll like see getting, what it, seeing the people that get in one liners is just nuts to me." Like that I'm one just guy like, who is he? Who's a superstar that like doesn't like twelve oh five or something like that? It seems like I'm exaggerating, but he posts on Twitter every day. Oh, David Robinson or yeah, man, he's like, not David he's Robinson. Good, it's it's there's but there are like yeah, every year there's somebody who's got like the craziest like yeah, it's David stuff. Robinson. Is it? Yeah, hmm. yeah. every he has every a, like he posts on Twitter, he's like bam, he's right in there. He he also has a YouTube channel that he does. Um, oh, it does. Oh. oh, here I'll put it in the chat. He does like Tidy Tuesday. Like he'll go through like the Tidy ah, Tuesday okay. problems. And I like the guy, I don't know. How, he's just super smart guy. Like he just has, like, you just watch like an hour of it. It's crazy at how, like he can, you know what so it much. is. He speaks the tidy verse fluently. It's like when you actually like yeah. watch him, I mean, he can like take a total like novel problem and um, just using D player tidy R, you know, all the, you know, the basic, you know, sort of tidy verse packages and he can solve just about like any problem i mean once in a while there'll be like a base r you know bit but man him and um julia silgi are like yeah they can just you can just like give them a data set and like you know i've seen many of those videos it's pretty remarkable i i i i cannot like just 
code you know just with a bunch of people watching me i mean i could probably do some stuff but like they just are like going through it all anyway hey i will see you guys uh next week um have a good, good luck adventing right. if you can and um if i come i'm gonna try i gotta try at least one to just to keep up with ron a little bit but man <laughs> take care you can see you can see my solutions in this in the slack <laughs> they're not the greatest <laughs> oh man it's just uh, I, I one of them i did really well on like i was really happy with myself but it's just like i just sometimes you just like how do you how do you even like approach some of these problems you know like because i don't approach these problems in my day-to-day you know yeah there's like one i just like i looked at the code i write, wrote for like in python and i was like it was right. I, I looked at it. I'm like, this is horrific what I wrote. <laughs> like, it's so ugly. I want to like read back through it. But yeah, <laughs> sometimes you're just like, oh. I can't. But yeah, that's where I, in, in the most recent one, that's where I used the while loop to, you know, to go through all the, uh, to find a path to, uh, you know, so it's one of these things like you start at one location, you try to find a path to another location, right? Mm. Uh, straightforward algorithm, but the algorithm you need a while loop because you don't know when you're gonna get when you're gonna get there. Mm. Yeah, it's like, and then you just like, you, you, well, like, I use a while loop. Like you wonder if there's like frameworks, you know, yeah. that people like have in their mind. Like you said, like the algorithms, like you know, and like how to implement those yeah. algorithms efficiently in your R code is just like I just don't know it well enough to be like, oh, that's how you do well, that. Well, David, you know, I, I implemented a complete, you know, complete algorithm myself, the, whatever you call it, that, um, what's the guy's name? Dear Robinson. Dice? Or? No, no. Oh. Uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, right? Just implemented it from scratch for my solution. And Dear Robinson's like, oh, there's a tidy graph library for that. <laughs> boop, 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 done. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> like, <"Ugh."> <laughs> <laughs> And then there was another person on here. What's his name? He had like a one liner, something real crazy where it was like, it was something with like ASCII characters or something and like some number. Yeah, it's like this. Is it Aaron or Aaron Stanberg? Oh, yeah, he, he, he was doing for a while the, the golf, code golf on this, but it looks like he's giving up on that. Like some of them were like, early ones are more amenable. Like he's got like one liner sitting there. I'm like, what? So it's, it's crazy. Like I'm like sitting there writing like 60 lines of code and he's just like, Oh, here's one problem. One liner, second one, two liners. <laughs> so I'm just like, wow, this is amazing. But I actually funny, funny thing was this, if you go look at other people in other languages, like if you go on Reddit and you look at it, like I saw last year, somebody like solved a couple of the problems just using like pure regex or something. <laughs> I was just saying. like, like some, someone, 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 someone like put on the comment, like That's crazy. <laughs> someone put the comment at the end of it is like, why do you hate yourself? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's oh, just no. like, you read it and you're like, what, how, one, how do you know how to program in regex outside of just like string matching? And then t- like two, like, why would you try and solve these like complex problems with it? So, but I don't know. Things that people can do on the internet. So, anyways, all right. Well, I think that's all I have. So I'll, I'm gonna jump off, and uh, we'll talk to you guys later. All right, guys. See you next Thanks. week. Cool. Bye, guys. Have a good one. See right, you bye. next week. Bye.